Hello, everybody. I, I hope everybody is fine, is healthy, taking care of yourself and everybody else. So today our guest is Dr. Paulo Tanga. He is a senior astronomer from the Observatorio de la Côte d'Azur in France. And uh, he, he is also deputy manager of the coordination for of data processing and analysis consortium of Gaia mission in charge of the treatment of solar system objects. His main work is on physical properties of minor planets, their collisional and dynamical evolution, both by numerical simulations and observations. And uh, he's looking forward for, to a ma massive exploitation of occultations forming belt and NES near of objects, thanks to this contribution given by, by Gaia. And uh, today, uh, at this moment, we, we also have uh, the, the great opportunity of having uh, a student, Luana Liberato, that, who, who is there working uh, uh, with Paulo and his group. So it's a kind of uh, good opportunity for us to, to make some interchange and uh, start some, some good collaborations. So it's a pleasure to have you here, Paulo. And so you, you can start your presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure. Uh, uh, so I hope uh, it can be enjoyable, even in this virtual uh, uh, fashion, which we are now used to. Uh, let's hope to have the opportunity to meet uh, physically soon again, once uh, things will be improving. So uh, as uh, it was mentioned, uh, I started from working on physical properties but also on Gaia and in the end now I'm coming to some synthesis between what is called physical and what is called dynamical properties and I try to do, to show you that there is a strong link between the two and in fact we can use dynamical properties to study physical properties and vice versa so the distinction is not so sharp and uh, this is where Gaia and occultations comes into the game so first of all, uh, let me start with the big picture. Okay, everybody knows, but uh, so I'm not teaching you anything, nothing new, but just to uh, imagine uh, for a moment that what we observe today in, in this population of small bodies is the remain of a long evolution, which is was sometimes very chaotic evolution uh, in the solar system, starting from a disk which was warmer in the inside and with the form that formed the rocky planetesimals and colder in the external parts where uh, bodies rich in water and other ices were formed. And then all these went to uh, collisional dynamical evolution till the uh, solar system it observed today. And we observe just a small fraction of objects, so the remaining, a uh, very tiny fraction remaining of the, uh, the small bodies that were the bricks forming the large, uh, the major planets and all the objects in the solar system. So minor planets continue to be, as it was always considered in the past, the key to understanding the evolution of what happened. They provide many fundamental constraints and we have to, re to realize that the sample that we know in detail with physical properties, shapes, uh, spins, uh, composition, masses, uh, not to speak about densities, is very, very small with respect to what is existing. And so uh, much effort must be spent to understand the many uh, basic things that uh, come from uh, these small bodies uh, that uh, uh, constitute this reservoir of information in the end. So there are major problems to solve. I, everybody, I imagine, and those that are listening, uh, can think to their own uh, problems concerning minor planets. But uh, in fact, uh, basically, we are trying to find today the traces of what is the first generation of asteroids. So what are primitive asteroids, where they are? Uh, do they really represent the pristine formation remnants? Uh, what, how the big asteroids evolved? And that's a big question. Uh, did we have differentiated bodies, probably yes. We start to see uh, the 
compositional evidence of the presence of the asteroid mantles, uh, some asteroid iron cores uh, around in the belt, but uh, still the picture is fuzzy. Uh, for instance, differentiation in the collisional families uh, issued from the breakup of such large objects is not so obvious, uh, not everywhere. So there are still many questions open in that respect that are not uh, completely solved when we send space probes and with the images and data on the surfaces of these objects. You, see, you can see here arrow code. Uh, more recently, we, have, we, have visit, we are visiting uh, Bennu and Ryugu. And of course, we see rocks, dust, more or less presence of uh, regolith, fine regolith or no regolith, only cores, pebbles, whatever. Smooth surfaces like on arrow code with the hints of uh, merging of uh, all the planetesimals. But we know basically nothing about the internal structure. So even uh, knowing just the density, which can inform us on the macro porosity is already a big uh, uh, answer to some of these questions to know uh, what's inside this object. So now, as I, as I said, everybody can put uh, his own, her own questions on the top of this. And I just mentioned my preferred three questions, looking into a little bit, a little bit more detail. So I take the opportunity to mention some uh, science I explored over the last years. Uh, so one of my preferred problems concern a category of neglected objects which are called barbarian asteroids. They call barbarians because the asteroid Barbara was the first discovered with these properties. Which properties? Well, a peculiar uh, scattering properties which is seen by polarimetry and also spectra that you can see here as a set of uh, different objects of the barbarian category uh, that have this, a, a signature at around two micron of absorption that can only be well fitted, well reproduced, well modeled by assuming that this comes from uh, uh, iron oxide, which is inside the spinel, which is inside fluffy type CAI, the most ancient material formed in the solar system. So it is like looking at pieces of aliander like uh, meteorites into space, but uh, much enriched in CAI. Some of them, uh, to justify this band, must uh, reach uh, abundances of CAI around 30% or more, which is huge, and nobody can exactly explain how this works unless you invoke some special segregation of uh, the prim primordial uh, minerals during the formation of these objects. Uh, so uh, these uh, properties are probably related also to collisions. We see that there are some groups and scattered families that are composed by this kind of objects. And collisions are also found on the uh, first member of the family, which is Barbara. Here it's me observing an occultation by Barbara, this one, in uh, November 2009. And, uh, it was during the night uh, in Canary Island. You can see a just a small tail objective there. But the occultation, but with several cords, several stations, enable us to see that Barbara, in fact, has concavities. So when coupling this with the polarimetry, we obtain a nice uh, shape with concavities. And as you know, uh, photometry alone cannot solve concavities. You need something else, some resolved imaging, uh, which is very difficult due to the size of these objects and their distance, or some occultations. So these concavities are cer certainly the witness, the signature of a collision evolution. We could have sculpted these bodies. So we don't know exactly what we are observing. Is we are observing some uh, interiors that have been exposed or the result of some processing due to these uh, collisions. So it's very interesting to collect uh, data on, the on these objects. We made a survey with several observatories collecting spect spectroscopy, photometry, as set of articles that will remain for you in the video if you're interested. So uh, this is a quite open and uh, uh, still one to, to know better, one need to go towards smaller barbarian asteroids in barbarian family members, try to see their shape uh, if they resemble to Barbara for some other properties that try to track their spin and uh, light course and so on. So many things to be done. And uh, as you have seen, uh, uh, occultations can play a role. 
not by chance that I show you this to you. So another example of problem, the, the presence of asteroid satellites. Asteroid satellites are really uh, a key uh, element to understanding asteroid evolution because they, they probably are the result of a specific evolution mechanism uh, that form them by spin up of small asteroids or by collision around the larger asteroids. Uh, when you measure the properties of an asteroid satellite, of a satellite orbit, you can determine uh, a density, uh, sorry, a mass for the system. So if you know the size, you can also determine the density. And uh, accurate astrometry, it's uh, quite uh, interesting to see that can discover satellites from the wobbling of the primary. So if you imagine to have a, an asteroid for which you only see the primary because the secondary is a little bit smaller and it, the separation is, uh, is small between the two, you can inspect the wobblings in a range of a few milliard seconds, mass is called here. So this is the range of accuracy that Gaia can reach in astrometry. Now, if you look in the space of what we know today, the space of separation uh, and size of uh, asteroids harboring satellites today, you can see that you, you are two big families. Those that are resolved by imaging, so small satellites around very large asteroids for which the large asteroid can serve as a reference for adaptive optics uh, imaging, and uh, small binaries, small, small asteroids with a, with a satellite that are detected mainly from the light course by photometry or from a radar where they come close to the Earth. In the middle, you have this uh, no man's land, uh, it's kind of triangle, which, over, which basically is what, where Gaia can see satellites by astrometry. So up to now, Gaia has not published enough observation yet to look for this effect. But I'm pretty sure that people investigating this astrometry will be able to discover new satellites and characterize many. Now, another problem, another approach, uh, is the study of asteroid families that you know certainly very well, that are dispersed by the action of uh, an initial ejection velocity and then an evolution which is uh, uh, heavily driven by the Yarkovsky effect that uh, uh, this recoil force due to the emission of thermal photons uh, that determine a drift in the asteroid orbit. So if you plot a family in the uh, plane on proper semi-major axis and uh, inverse of the diameter, you can see that uh, it, it draws a kind of V, which is due to the fact that smaller asteroids drift faster due to Yarkovsky. So by measuring the Yarkovsky drift, you can put, uh, you can derive the ages. So you can derive the epoch when the collision in the family occurred. And uh, this uh, is also very interesting because Gaia is measuring many, many asteroids with accurate astrometry. So it will be able, we hope, to reach the accuracy sufficient to detect the Yarkovsky directly in the, in the main belt uh, by the uh, astrometry from Gaia. Uh, Besides that, Gaia provides also low resolution spectra, uh, very accurate photometry, so you can determine spin properties that are linked to the efficiency of Yarkovsky and also uh, composition, which uh, is an indicator of the membership uh, uh, to verify the membership of, membership of uh, asteroids to a given family of a certain taxonomic type. So Gaia will obtain uh, data for about 350,000 asteroids in a homogeneous way. So it's very useful uh, uh, survey for the solar system. So if we put everything together, in the end, uh, we can see that Gaia can play a role on many aspects. Uh, of course, I mentioned asteroid satellites can be discovered, measure the Yarkovsky drift, but also uh, it will determine new asteroid masses because by having a big jump forward in the accuracy of astrometry, of course, you can reach uh, more uh, asteroid masses in a more accurate way. And it can improve the prediction of stellar occultations we know to derive shape and size, as we mentioned, for many scientific applications. So now, 
The, the improvement of occultation brings another consequence with it, that in fact, occultation is again a super accurate astrometry, because basically when the asteroid is overlapping the star, if you know the position of the star given by Gaia with a very high accuracy, you again get an astrometric measurement for the asteroid that you can exploit. And this is very, very powerful. So if we look what Gaia has already done very quickly uh, with the publication of uh, DR2 in 2018, there have, have been already some uh, uh, exercises done to detect uh, Yarkovsky on some asteroids. So the first one, we, the easiest one was uh, Aten. Well, it has already a Yarkovsky detected from the ground, uh, many observations, including radar. But by adding uh, 70 uh, observations by Gaia, the 70 observations available in the data release to all the others that are the majority, the vast majority, but less accurate, you can see that you improve uh, uh, the signal to noise of the detection of Yarkovsky by uh, lowering the error bar. Uh, you improve it already by a factor 1.6 or 1.7. So uh, the combination of Gaia with other data significantly changes and improves the signal to noise, of the signal to noise ratio of the Yarkovsky detection, uh, provided that some uh, uh, coherent combination with the optical observations available is, is done. You basically need some, uh, the bias scheme to correct all the astrometry due to their systematic effort. So this is a kind of seminar on its own, so I let it aside for the moment. It's a, it's a very interesting technical problem, but uh, uh, maybe for another opportunity. Now, uh, another case was Phaeton. Phaeton had a close encounter in 2017, the many radar and optical data, some old radar measurements done before, this is the distribution of observations available at Minor Planet Center. With Gaia observed Phaeton during the uh, range of uh, uh, 22 months covered by the data release too. And so without Gaia, there was a signal to noise round three, uh, the JPL solution of the orbit. With Gaia, this jumps to signal to noise is 60. So it's a very solid uh, detection of your cost. Uh, okay. We will come back to Phaeton later on. And just to complete the picture on Yarkovsky with the, by Gaia DR2, uh, I also mentioned that uh, we, of course, attempted the detection of Yarkovsky on ho the whole sample of Gaia DR2 asteroids. And uh, even if this sample is quite restricted, uh, because then uh, if, we, if you look for small asteroids where uh, uh, Yarkovsky can be detected, in fact, uh, you end up with uh, no such a large number of objects. Well, uh, we had uh, over these 60 candidates that remain with the diameter less than five kilometers, 20 detections of Yarkovsky, which is huge. It's about one third of what it was available in year two only. Uh, so we started from uh, 14,000 asteroids. Most of them were larger than five kilometers. 60 were smaller than five and we obtain 20 Yarkovsky detection, which is huge. Some of these asteroids that have good Yarkovsky detection, so signal to noise close to free, not yet free, but nearly so, uh, are, uh, I would say, Mars crossers and uh, nearly in the inner main belt. So we are very close to directly measure Yarkovsky in the main belt, with what is not yet done currently. Okay, so like, let's come now to the core of all these because as we mentioned, uh, occultations can uh, bring uh, more uh, astro accurate astrometry and then reach these data that permit going uh, even deeper into our investigation. Oh, sorry, I go, went back. Okay. So as you know, the uncertainty on the prediction of an occultation is a combination uh, basically of two components. So the uncertainty on the ephemeris of the asteroid and the uncertainty on the position of the star. Now, today with Gaia, we can say that the uncertainty in the position of the star usually plays a minor role with respect to the position, the error on the position of the asteroid. And you are, of course, interested to the position which is in the component across track with respect to the occultation. If you want to position observers uh, to capture the shadow uh, cast by the asteroid on Earth. Uh, a fundamental parameter to 
understand uh, very quickly and very easily if the occultation is easy to observe or not, which is the probability to get a positive, getting close to the predicted shadow, is the ratio between uh, the total uncertainty and the size of the object. Of course, if this comes close to one, it means that the uncertainty, uh, uh, the uncertainty band is uh, as a width, which is close to this object size. So uh, in fact, it, it means that the prediction will be very good and the, the, the chances will be good. But in order to arrive to be good for asteroids like this, you can see here the situation for an asteroid which is 10 kilometers in size. Uh, looking back to history, it was a, lo a longer a long, uh, story. Uh, for a nearer project, it, 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 was, it, it has been always uh, a bigger challenge because they move fast and they are smaller. So the first attempt to obtain an occultation uh, for any object was on February 19, 1958, and the asteroid Juno, which is more than 100 kilometers in size, occulted a star of magnitude 9 in Orion. And this was the first uh, attempt to observe an occultation. Uh, three years later, there was the first positive, which was Pallas, much larger, so easier to predict in some sense because uh, the more latitude to place the observers. Uh, it occulted the star of magnitude 9 uh, from Africa and India, and it was recorded by I. And there was there were some sparse uh, attempts in following 20 years, followed by some success. And the first near asteroids had to wait till January 24, 1975. So the results were published in this article in 1976 in, on Icarus. And uh, it turns out that uh, this occultation produced the first silhouette of an occultation, the first silhouette of an asteroid by occultation. And you have to understand that all these uh, uh, chord extremes are recorded by eye. Uh, these are visual observation with a stop clock at hand, uh, but uh, it was quite a pretty well good done job and uh, the observers were in the uh, west uh, i think were in california or something like that uh, they were well placed and they had the chance to be well placed and to record this uh, uh, this event because the orbit the eros was an asteroid that had many many observations so its orbit was already quite good and in the conclusion of the article we can read that uh, it is hoped this event will stir up more interest among professional and amateurs alike, kind of prophetic words. Uh, these are not uh, particularly rare, uh, but the low precision and low accuracy of the ephemeris are a problem. We could make a list of at least 200, 300 objects that to, uh, with reliable ephemeris, and the task of predicting and refining the prediction definitely seems to be useful undertaking and should lead to the observation of several such events every year. Now we will see we are going to have several such events every week or every, or every month. Now, several years later, let's say 1986, uh, it's not a lifetime ago. I was already aware of what was happening in the sky by the time because I was an amateur astronomer. And I heard already talking about asteroid occultation, but it was quite a funny game in the hands of a few amateurs that tried, uh, because even for large asteroids, it was very difficult to hope to obtain a positive. You can see here the shadow of predicted for this occultation by Cleopatra in May 1986. And the one sigma uncertainty is basically a continent size, what you have today for some TNOs. And uh, so it was very, very difficult. You could place observers anywhere on the American continent and uh, pretty be sure that uh, uh, you would not observe with high probability the occultation. So in uh, 2007, with my colleague Marco Delbo, we uh, studied the uncertainty of the orbits of asteroids at, at the time. So we're talking about 15 years ago already. And uh, as a function of the diameter, you can plot uh, the ratio that I mentioned before. So the uncertainty divided the apparent size of the object. This is computed the opposition for simplicity, and you obtain this nice relation showing that, of course, 
for larger asteroids that have a longer observational arc and many more observations that are more accurate because they give more photons uh, to record, uh, you have a better accuracy. So the uncertainty can go down to the level of the asteroid size. So this is uh, these 100 asteroids in the box here, which is an uncertainty uh, to size ratio of one, are the best for the prediction of occultation. We are the best at the time. And maybe you could be more generous and just uh, increase a little bit this limit to attempt uh, uh, to observe asteroids with a little bit uh, uh, poorer uh, orbit, and you get a sample of some thousand asteroids, okay? So this is... Uh, this was the situation and we were predicted already with Gaia, probably this limit, all this distribution would move down by a couple of orders of magnitude, uh, exploding basically the number of asteroids for which you can have an accurate uh, prediction. Uh, by that time, as we will talk more about Phaeton, Phaeton was uh, placed around here. So the uncertainty on the position of Phaeton was about 100 times uh, uh, its, its size. No hope to observe an occultation by Phaeton there. Now today the situation is much improved, even for an asteroid here, which is not a very small, but it's kind of typical, that was considered to be observable a few years ago with a reasonable probability of occultation. Today can give a rise to a prediction which is very, very good, excellent, I would say, and, and can give a very, very high probability of success. This was uh, a picture that I put here that comes from a uh, few months ago. Now the situation is even better because uh, JPL is incorporated Gaia data. And so if you use JPL orbits to predict occultation for this asteroid, you basically are no longer able to distinguish the one sigma region for the, from the nominal width of the shadow of it. So we are really doing very, very well with the uh, uh, Miller second uh, precision on the position of these objects that were observed by Gaia and published in uh, Gaia DR2. So uh, let's uh, mention now a little bit of summary on the impact of Gaia on stellar occultations. Okay, before Gaia, uh, for the bulk of the prediction uh, came from the Parkostico catalog of stars. 100,000 star, uh, 100, uh, stars uh, with the uh, asteroids that were 40 kilometers or larger to, be, to have some reasonable, uh, a reasonable sample of good orbits. Uh, and typically, a given site anywhere on Earth could observe a few events positive per year, even uh, with a constant effort, because most of them were still negative with, uh, with this sample. Now, with Gaia, the explosion, the, the explosion of the numbers tells everything. So you have 1 billion stars in principle down to magnitude 20, 20.5. 20 in fact, there are 1.6 billion in uh, DR2. But in practice, you have to limit to magnitude 14 or 15 if you want to use uh, larger telescopes. But even with that, you are no longer constrained to 100,000. We are still speaking about many million stars, uh, tens of million stars with uh, completeness of the magnitude on the sky. Uh, you can go down to much smaller asteroids that we mentioned, after a few kilometers become feasible. And so it, does, it means that this multiplication factor translates into many events that are observable theoretically each night from any side for a star magnitude 14, 15 at the faint. And this is uh, also uh, translates also in big success, as you know, in the campaigns that have been led, such as the Lucky Star Initiative, by Bruno, coordinated by Bruno Sicardi in Paris, to observe TNOs, or the targets of the Lucky mission, less emission for the like, Jupiter Trojans. Uh, you have more good prediction than what is possible to observe at present. Uh, so, if you, if you want to have a better uh, idea of what means uh, improving the accuracy on the orbit by Gaia, just to choose this simple uh, object that I, I find very, very uh, immediate to understand. Uh, you have this, uh, you run an orbital fit and then you check the distribution of the residuals. So zero residual means that not an observation that is exactly coinciding 
uh, with the prediction given by, from your fitted orbit, but in general observations spread around. And you can see all the observations maybe done with photographic plates uh, spread around by a few arc seconds. Now, if you zoom in the middle, you have the cloud of observations obtained by CCD uh, in, uh, over the last uh, uh, about 30, 35 years. And uh, this spread around uh, 200 million seconds. And you start seeing a small cloud of red dots inside. And if you zoom, here it is. This is the, these are the residuals on this orbital fit for the Gaia data, which are in red. So you go down to about five milliseconds. So you have several hundreds improvements in the quality of the astrometry that immediately translates as a big weight in the orbit determination process. Because of course then uh, different uncertainties translates into different weights on your fit. And so this uh, observation, even if there are a small number, uh, are really uh, important in determining the final accuracy. So the fingerprint of the new stellar catalog by Gaia and the new asteroid orbits is already visible in the distribution in the trend in time of uh, the number of positive observations obtained and occultations in general. So all the events together, mainly dominated, of course, by main belt asteroids in this kind of statistics. And you can see uh, the time when Gaia DR1 was published, 2000, uh, well, it should be, sorry, it should be 2016, it's a little bit shifted. So you have the first rise of a uh, uh, number of events, and then the current surge, which is mostly triggered by Gaia DR2 in 2018. And up to now, this is mostly due to the incorporation of uh, the improvement of uh, star astrometry. Not yet the improvement of orbit, as I said, that was, uh, let's say, diffused uh, more systematically by JPL and will be also by Minor Planet Center soon, uh, only very recently, weeks ago. So now the, a new frontier opens because it's not only an explosion of number, but you can also try, of course, to do more difficult asteroids. And the small near Earth asteroids are for sure the new frontier. So here, what I plotted over time is the minimum diameter. Uh, so the smallest asteroid that has been observed every year, starting from the early observation in the 60s. Uh, so this is a sample that has produced some useful astrometry. So there may be some uh, uh, holes, some small data should appear in between. But you see in logarithmic scale, a nice trend with the improvement of orbits of their history towards observing uh, smaller and smaller uh, asteroids by occultation successfully. So this is clearly visible in the crosses, which represent the smallest main belt that you, you provide, pro produced a positive occultation. But also in the red dots, there was some poor success in the past with some uh, large NEOs such as Neo and Ganymede, Eros and Ganymede, then there was the Toro asteroid, which is smaller, five kilometers, but it was kind of isolated uh, success with a single cold observation. Eros again, more recently, and then the big change became, uh, pos became possible with the Phaeton and more recently Apophis. Phaeton, five kilometers in size, between five and six. Apophis, uh, three hundred, uh, sorry, uh, Yes, 370 average diameter, so every, meters of diameter, so very, very small with respect to the rest of the population. So what happens is that, in fact, of course, now the prediction by Phaeton and by the small asteroids can become accurate at the expense of some uh, uh, specific effort, because, for instance, there were also radar observations which were seminal to obtain the best accuracy. So uh, I just illustrate what happens typically with one of these small asteroids. It was an event that we observed, so it's one uh, which, uh, to which I am particularly uh, attached. This is, uh, was in October 15, sorry, year is missing, is uh, 2019, and was passing very close to Nice. So the blue lines are the limits of the shadow, and the red lines are the one sigma limits. If you zoom in, you can see some... Uh, uh, roads and across the mountains where we placed uh, a big telescope. So we traveled with a one meter foldable Dobsonian, which was mounted in the field 
very nice to see. We convinced the, the uh, owner of the telescope that it was very important to move the telescope that evening. And uh, we were lucky enough to record the occultation. I don't, don't know if the, the streaming uh, enables you to see the movie correctly, but look at the couple of stars in the center. And you can see that uh, there is just a minor tracking problem there. And then one of the two disappears. And here is the occultation. Uh, every, here, here, everything is slowed down because the rate we were able to use with the camera in such a big telescope was about uh, 100 images per second, a little bit more, 120 images per second. So we we're very, very fast for an event which was very, very short. And in fact, the light curve shows that the duration uh, was uh, 0 0.218 seconds. But uh, with this good sampling, it was very uh, easy to determine very precisely the start and the end of the occultation. Now, if you translate this timing, which of course is the natural, uh, the, let's say the pure data that you obtain from the occultation, which is time, you can translate it into a distance, knowing the velocity of Phaeton on the sky, and you find that the accuracy on the length of the chord is just uh, one percent, so 45 meters uh, on a chord that is five kilometers, so nearly equatorial for, for fit. And uh, this corresponds to an error of 67 microseconds relative to the position of the star, of course, which is what Gaia does even better somehow. Now, of course, this is not the end of the story because to derive the final astrometry from such an observation, you have to take into account the other cores to try their uncertainty, try to fit a shape onto it, uh, and uh, this was the shape that was oriented, uh, the radar shape oriented at the time of the occultation, uh, and take into account also the uncertainty on the star, which is not zero. In this case, uh, it's a fraction of a million second coming from Gaia DR2. So the final uncertainty is something between one and two million second. But still, it's awesome. You can get with a telescope on the ground Gaia accuracy. Uh, even more awesome Apophis. So for Apophis, Apophis now we have a, a, a four of occultations that have been successful. And here you can see the first one with the three cores that were observed in the United States. So there were about 30 stations deployed uh, because the uncertainty was still a kind of 1.5 kilometers in size with an object that makes less than 400 meters. So there were 30 stations deployed to cover the one sigma region, and three of them catch the shadow of the object. Uh, here again, the total uncertainty remaining by taking into account all the, the sources of error is around 1.5 million second. Uh, the fitted diameter here is uh, 493 meters. If you uh, adjust a little bit the course in the hypothesis that there is some uh, uh, delays that have not been corrected well, uh, and you can fit a better circle, it comes 456. But now Apophis, we know, is not a circle, so there may be some shape effects in there. And this is quite a large diameter. Uh, we, we expect it's something smaller, around 370 meters, not more, not nearly 500. So there is still some uh, uh, efforts to be done to understand exactly this data. We discover that, in fact, uh, astrometry at the level of accuracy of one mass for uh, near Earth asteroids contains some uh, tricky aspects in the data reduction, not only in the prediction, but in the data reduction too. So this must be taken into account to get the best, the best result. But uh, even more amazing, two of these cores have been observed by objectives that are eight centimeters in size. So basically photographic objectives with a camera fixed on the ground. So this is what you can obtain. Gaia level astrometry with teleobjective uh, on the ground uh, at a distance. Quite impressive. So, as I said, there were several attempts now in NEOS. So, uh, Phaeton, several observations in 2019, uh, 2020. Apophis, four success, uh, very, very recent this, mo this month uh, and in March. Uh, in the end, uh, we discovered there could be some problem in the 
in one of them because uh, it doesn't fit so well the orbit as the others. There are a few million seconds of residuals, possibly error on the stellar astrometry. And then uh, we also attempted on Didymos, which uh, is now getting accuracy on the orbit, which is close to what is feasible. But uh, due to COVID, you can see here the little virus, it was very difficult to organize an expedition. So there was just a too small number of telescopes for an, for an attempt that was done in Greece on April uh, this year. But uh, still, if you go at this link, I have no time to detail here, but you can see what does it mean to detect Apophis uh, by occultation, an, an accurate occultation that uh, improves by a factor two the uncertainty on the Yarkovsky effect. So uh, Apophis becomes now the object with the best Yarkovsky determination we have. Uh, okay, now let's come back to uh, a more general, uh, again, view. Uh, I mentioned the uh, NEOs, but we know that the bulk of the data set available for occultations are, uh, in fact, the main belt asteroids. And you know how the astrometric measurement works. Uh, you observe uh, uh, on the plane on the sky, if you, if you look at the occultation as it is seen from the geocenter, in general, it is not really an occultation. It is an apples with a star because the geocenter, an observer at the center of the Earth, does not necessarily see uh, the shadow. It can be shifted by a certain distance. And observers on the ground can have projected cores that are observed uh, like this with their timings. So you can use these timings to put the observations together with respect to a reference core, then maybe use the timing of the closest appeals uh, as a reference and determine somehow the barycenter of this occultation. For instance, by fitting a shape model, a circle, and an ellipse, depending upon how many uh, uh, observations you have. And this way you get the shape and the position referred to the star. So illustrating like this, it looks easy. In fact, there are many tri tricky problems when you want to go really at the milliard second accuracy. You have, for instance, to take into account the differential or relativistic light deflection between the asteroid and the star. So I have no time to go into many details here, but basically what you observe from the ground is the overlap of the asteroid and the star at the moment of the occultation. But uh, what is happening physically is a bending of the light ray on which the uh, the, uh, the star and the asteroid lie. So they share the same light path because the asteroid is occulting it, but uh, on a, at a, with a different uh, uh, length because uh, the asteroid is closer than the star. So this means the deflection for the, for, uh, due to the masses in the solar system, basically due to the sun, will be larger uh, for the for the star and for the asteroid. So you have a difference of deflection that you have to take into account to reduce the astrometry. And this can sum up to a few milliard seconds. So in case, for instance, of a near-Earth object, it's already larger than it, its apparent size. It's a large effect in that case, it cannot be neglected. So then, imagine that you, you take into account everything correctly. You have observations that are fitted by several cores or a few cores. You fit a complex shape or an approximated shape. You obtain a center of the figure, and this is your astrometric measure. So then you need an error model. You need to give an error to that. And what is done, uh, uh, let's say, on the massive exploitation of what is, uh, has been observed up to now, which has a few thousands of uh, asteroid occultations, is mostly coordinated by David Herald, who is a very uh, accurate in uh, uh, finding a kind of recipe to give uh, an uncertainty on uh, different kind of occultations, depending how well the occultation is observed, how many cores you have, and so on. You can find this in the monthly notices article that is mentioned here, with many details, interesting details. Uh, this is the error model with which the observation of occultations are now transmitted to Minor Planet Center. They are also available on the PDS repository of NASA. And then you need some, uh, to exploit this, you need some orbit equality indicators. Of course, most obvious is the family's uncertainty, but this must be referred to an epoch. 
or the uncertainty on the semi metal axis, which I will exploit uh, now in the few slides remaining. Uh, now, uh, of course, you also have the post fit residual that I already mentioned, and they give the quality of a single observation related to the orbital fit. So the errors and the residuals, both of them, can be represented uh, in a different way. So either as an absolute value, so an angle on the sky, arc second or milli arc second, or in units of the object size in radius. Of course, if you have a residual for an observation for a measurement of an occultation that is larger than the size of the object, this would imply a miss. So it means that the, that observation is somehow problematic, if we want to say uh, roughly what the, the, the meaning of that. And the best representation of both errors and the residuals is not in the uh, right ascension or declination direction or another coordinate system on the sky. It is uh, in the along track and the cross track direction. Because basically, a long track direction is where you have the timing is most accurate, and the cross track is where the shape that you uh, fit uh, plays the major role in uh, determining your, uh, your precision uh, of the. So uh, along and across, we have a very, very different independent uh, measurements. And this is the, the plane, the, the, the direction in which you must project your, your uh, residuals and errors to understand what's happening. So with the, I had the chance to work with the PhD students uh, up to last year on what can be expected as accuracy uh, from uh, uh, observing uh, by having a telescope, but imagine we have a telescope that observes a single course and uh, uh, you fit uh, uh, the light curve of the, of the course and then you take into account the uncertainty coming from the fact that with a single course you don't know which part of the asteroid in fact intercepting your, uh, your, your star. So, but just by looking, by taking into account the source of uncertainty and looking at the right hand uh, plot, you can see that uh, basically in all diameters in this range between five and 50 kilometers, you, you get a milliard second accuracy on, uh, on the astrometric measurement, which is, uh, I, I would say very, very meaningful and uh, and it, it enables to collect by a, by a occultation, of course, many, many data. Uh, clearly, there is a trend which depends on size. Larger object, as we have an error which is uh, related to the apparent size of the asteroid, will have a larger error in, this, in the final uh, uh, astrometry because we are considering we observe only a single core. When you have many observers with multiple cores, of course, this is no longer applicable and the situation is much better. So you reach Gaia level astrometry from the ground, potentially with modest instrument. Amateur level instruments can observe most events from the size of objects in the main. Uh, so what happens when we take all these observations, we put them together, we can look uh, uh, at the role of the catalog, which is very well visible, that is used to reduce the occultations. So the left plot shows the typical residuals you have uh, on the post-fit uh, orbit residual by putting together all occultation using all the occultation data, so forgetting about all the other astrometry available, and fitting asteroid orbits. So here you have the typical residuals when you use the different catalogs that were available before Gaia and that were used, in fact, to predict each event that was used for uh, the occultation work. So you have residuals that are typically between 50 and 100 million seconds. If you use Gaia DR2, you get residuals that are typically down to a few million seconds as expected. Let's say the average here probably around 10 million seconds. Uh, you have two Gaia columns because uh, one is for stars that are flagged as problematic by, by Gaia itself. And in fact, you can see the problematic star as a astrometry which is worse, even still acceptable, but uh, there are, let's say the performance is, uh, is much, uh, that is degraded with respect to the best Gaia stars, which is somehow expected. Now, I don't, uh, I see the time is, uh, is running short, so let me go to the global picture here. Uh, again, we look uh, at the same thing here in another, from another perspective. So we, we took all the uh, occultation observation of uh, 
uh, asteroids were observed by occultation. We fit an orbit to them, and we compute the uncertainty on the semi-major axis, which is an ind indicator of the orbital quality. This is published in the article by Federica Spot 2017. And we compare in this plot the occultation obtained, the, the uncertainty obtained with this method on the semi-major axis to the uncertainty obtained by using all the rest of the astrometry available at minor planet center. So this uh, exercise was done by using stars published with a very early and preliminary data radius of Gaia, which is data radius number one. But you can already see that even with this preliminary release, a few objects, a few lucky ones, have a, an uncertainty below the red line, which is, means it is better with only a few occultations, maybe 10 or 12, uh, than by using thousands of astrometric data available at the minor planet center. Now, what happens if we introduce DR2? Well, the situation improves by much because uh, all this uh, set of points, of course, drift toward a lower level and the majority of objects, in fact, have a better orbit by using occultation only than by using all the other observations, which is quite amazing. Uh, so few, few occultation can beat in accuracy decades of ground-based data. And this also works in incidentally, if you, instead of occultation, you use only direct astrometry of asteroids obtained by Gaia. But uh, the sample of DR2 is uh, restricted and only 22 months of observation. So you just, you need for that lucky objects with well-distributed observations, so it can become uh, uh, real and more solid as a conclusion once we have the whole Gaia data set. So this is, these are all the residuals starting from year to 2000 because before the techniques were, of occultation observations were various, but you can see the residuals a long track and the cross track. Of course, they are a little bit better a long track where you have the timing accuracy and all of them peak around this few months in the center. Okay, and this is uh, what happens if you consider one object only, its residuals. Uh, this is Artemis, which is one of uh, the best asteroids behaving with the, the, its occultations. And you can see here the residuals, uh, a long track and the cross track for, for the observed occultation 17 for uh, Artemis. Uh, the segments around each dot represent the assigned error from the error model of the occultation. And if you look at the right plot, this is now the error normalized to the radius of the object. So the size of our term is the average size is represented by the circle. And as expected, you can see that all occultations fall into this circle. So they are co coherent with the, uh, the, the orbit solution and the observation. Except one, this outlier here, while at one sigma, it could still be compatible, but if one looks better into the details, this star in the Gaia catalog hmm, is suspicious. It has a flag that tells that maybe it could be an unresolved binary, so it could be a bad star, bad behaving star, which looks consistent with what we obtain. So I come to a conclusion here. What's next? We have a list of uh, future candidates to uh, survey for occultations. Most of them uh, have very, very low orbital certainty already. So we believe that in this data set, maybe uh, also using maybe some more objects that are not in this list, here are just a few of the, the, the say the top 12, the top 13 of, of, the, of the data, uh, of the best orbits. Uh, probably there are some that maybe with some additional ground-based observation or some additional radar can become very, very good candidate for future occultation uh, observations. Uh, of course, NIA remain difficult and fast. You can see here the duration, typical duration is between these two extremes for this object. A few of them reach several tenths of a second, but most often duration less than zero one second. Uh, for Didymos, it worked very well, the process. You can see here in this plot very quickly the error on the ephemeris that we had with all observations in 2003, 2004. 
Then there was the radar added, which improved the things a little bit. But this is the error on the ephemeris that we get today. We want to observe occultation by Didymus today. So by propagating the orbit as computed in 2003, we still get bigger uh, error, er error ellipses that range between uh, uh, minor axis of uh, uh, 10 and uh, uh, 100 times the upper end size of the object, which is the unit used here. Now, if we had all optical data available up to now, things start to improve. So here you get an uncertainty, which is around 10 times the opposite size. And uh, we had the luck to, op to use several observations that were collected, collected in the frame of the working group of the HERA mission and DART that are targeting Didymos. And so by using this additional astrometry, now we get to a range where the uncertainty get close to the sides of Didymos. So we clearly get close to the possibility of observing directly uh, the observation, uh, the, the occultations by Didymos. So this is one of our next priority targets. And please, if you want look into prediction for Didymos, we can work together and organize something maybe across continents when uh, Didymos looks, uh, falls close to your places. Uh, now, if we target the whole main belt, what happens? The number of events, of course, explodes for a single site. So we made some simulations by using 100,000 of asteroids, basically of asteroids larger than one kilometer or two kilometer. And we get some numbers, probability of success with current uh, orbit accuracy. And by taking factors for orbit improvement, which in the red rectangle are in the range of what we can expect in a, from now on with Gaia data, uh, we obtain some uh, numbers for expected positive that are a few hundred per year uh, by using this sample. And uh, uh, if you accept a success rate of 10%, of course, we have a, you end up with a 2,000 events to observe uh, every year, which means several events per, per month. Uh, now, I don't uh, look into too much into the details of the numbers here because I don't want to stress these uh, as not absolute numbers because, of course, if you go to 10% accuracy and you want to observe more asteroids, you can go to fainter stars uh, or accept uh, smaller asteroids, so you can get a number or very large number of events potential to observe. And this is a typical duty that is uh, very well suited to robotic telescopes too, not only to amateurs and uh, professional astronomers, astronomers with traditional telescopes. When you, when you want to monitor and to collect astrometry systematically, you can use a robotic telescope. So we are building one in Nice. This is the telescope that is installed in its dome, 50 centimeter telescope. Uh, in one year, it should be fully robotic. For the moment, it's been remotized, so we will be use, able to use it remotely. And uh, one of the camera will be devoted to uh, the occultation of, uh, of by asteroids. So the telescope, of course, is only part of the story because uh, uh, data processing, storage, and sharing is a major problem. We have to think that we cannot work in isolation with respect to what has been done up to now from the community of amateur astronomers, uh, from other astronomers. So we have to handle also this interface with the amateur community. We are thinking about uh, clearly a non-data architecture in which we share everything that is being collected to be able to put the, the data in common. So I think this is the way to go. So I conclude with it, my takeaway messages with, my, with this uh, rapid overview. The Gaia revolution is clearly impacted the activity of occultation now, uh, the activity of the observers, and also the data reduction and the effort of prediction, which are still very, very critical for small asteroids. Uh, it's a natural consequence that this evolution occurs for occultations. And occultation, of course, can be exploited for astrometry beyond the time frame of the mission. So you will be able, by occultation, to collect Gaia level astrometry when Gaia level will have finished for several years after. And this is a very, very nice perspective, especially when we want to study secular effects like Yarkovsky that require a lot of observation over a long time scale. So there are approaches that uh, classic approaches removable station that uh, remain uh, very useful 
when you target specific events, when you target narrow occultation paths. But there is also space now for robotic station and even for network of robot stations, maybe in a close future, to ensure collection of multiple cores, not only for single cores. And so result for asteroid size and shape. There are difficulties we are fighting with, uh, for NEOs in particular. In the prediction, for instance, we have to take into account uh, appropriately the role of topography of the ground, the region in which you are deploying the observers, if you want to exploit the, uh, the prediction at best. And there may be other subtle effects, as I mentioned, that can uh, come into game of uh, exploiting this data. Uh, so we must also be prepared to process uh, and to store and to share a large amount of occultation data. And uh, as I mentioned, this must be done by involving uh, uh, all the observers that are available, also the community of amateur astronomers. They are the, the real citizen scientists that can, be, can do this activity by small telescopes. And uh, with this, I thank you so much with your attention, for your attention. Thanks, Paolo. Very nice uh, review or up to date review of Gaia and uh, occultation of minor bodies. Fantastic. That was really great. So I hope you enjoyed. Yeah, yeah, very much, very much. So now now we, we are open for, for questions or comments. So anybody would like to make a, a comment or a question? Everybody's thinking to the telescope they can use to observe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Gio, you can you can open your mic and, and say your question, please. Hello, fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. I was dealing with autonomous optical navigation. You see, when you were presenting your improvement concerning new Gaia data, I was just figuring out two nav cams tracking two small bodies in, in, inside the spacecraft and solving on board with high precision the whole problem of navigation. Do you, 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 you know what I mean about the, this it, autonomous navigation? Would it be possible? Well, um, I, th uh, I know that there have been uh, some uh, studies. I was in particular in the jury of uh, a student in a Paris Observatory who studied this, po this possibility to have an autonomous navigation system on aboard the satellite that uh, by triangulation with minor planets, in fact, is able to cross the solar system and uh, to explore the, uh, let's say, to navigate across the main belt by using minor planets and their ephemeris as a possibility to, uh, to to have a reference in real time. Yeah, but uh, but, um, I, uh, but the improvement, you see this, this geometric method is highly dependent on the precision of the, the position of the, the, the bodies. You see, if you, if you could follow a small body like a comet or a, a ast an asteroid, and then pursuit, the occultations occurring. You see, you have already star trackers on board the spacecraft. So if you follow the, the occultations of small bodies, like asteroids, for instance, a, a one asteroid with this highly knowledge on the, the its orbit, so you could do that. You could transfer that precision to the orbit determination process. And that could be well, done autonomously, you see, not a planet. Planets, they, they... Yeah, yeah. I see, see. Well, this, is a, this is an amazing idea. So it, basically, you, you must have a system on the, on the satellite itself to observe the occultation while it moves uh, to, 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 to get his accurate position. And I think, in fact, there is a clear gain because usually the telemetry is not enough to get a, a very accurate position. Even for Gaia itself, to reduce the astrometry of Gaia, we have to use additional information that comes from a performing astrometry of Gaia by telescope, the Gaia satellite itself, among the stars from the ground. So 
basically what you are suggesting, if I understand well, is to use occultation seen from the spacecraft itself. And this could be very interesting to a very interesting principle to explore. Yeah, the, the, I saw the whole process in my mind a few minutes ago. But thanks to <laughs> to your presentation. Discuss, <laughs> it's very interesting. We should discuss more about that. Okay, but I'm not uh, uh, thinking in in satellites. Or I mean, around Earth, I I, I I am thinking on planetary missions. You see? Yeah, yeah, I understand. I understand. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ju. Anybody else? Well, I have a question. Well, it's not really a question about this last slide you are talking about robotic observations. So, is there any any tentative proposal of making a, a, an international net on that or something like that? Well, as you know, on a general occultation activity, amateur astronomers are very active already and constitute, constitute a network. Let's say that here in Europe, uh, we are quite densely populated. So uh, anywhere an occultation passes, you can probably find along the track some amateurs that they can observe. Of course, this cannot be the case for very critical events where you want to ensure a very good coverage and then you have to move telescopes. But uh, I'm, I, I'm certainly uh, favorable to the idea that uh, one could have a network of robotic telescopes that do this. Uh, there are already networks devoted to uh, occultation by TNOs. For instance, Mark Bouye of uh, Swiri in uh, Boulder has a network of telescopes that uh, relies mainly on schools and uh, uh, universities along the west coast of the United States. But the typical, the typical spacing of these telescopes is more suited to observe objects that are several hundred kilometers in size, that are TNOs. And here, what we will need is a network that uh, spans maybe between 1, 10, or 20 kilometers to observe the interesting targets in the main belt, which are the small asteroids, for which we have uh, much less information. At that, that level, it would be very, very interesting to have the networks of uh, a small constellation of uh, five or six telescopes spaced by one or two kilometers. I see. Okay, okay. Good. So, anybody else? Any other for the question? Bruno, please, Bruno Morgado. Uh, hi, Paulo. Uh, just a quick hi, question uh, about this robotic network. Apart from occultations, you have any ideas of more science that this robotic network can do? Yes, of course. Uh, in, and uh, with this telescope, this single robotic telescope we are building, of course, it cannot be justified only by observing some occultations per night. It has to spend its time usefully. And I think a, a very useful way is, for instance, to obtain light curves of uh, uh, asteroids systematically, which can be done uh, uh, robotically very, very well, uh, because, of course, uh, there you have many, many targets per night. Uh, you can do uh, photometry with uh, in standard filters to derive mineralogic properties or uh, even just get a, a good absolute magnitude for asteroids that are very, very close to a position. You know, absolute magnitude H is very poorly known in the catalogs today. And now you have basically Gaia reference stars everywhere. So you just point asteroids at a very small phase angle and you can determine very accurately H values to make a light curve just around the position. These are, there can be many, many ideas which are very well suited to a telescope that can switch rapidly from one target to the other and make probably several light curves along the, a single night. Uh, thank you. We are thinking about this network here in Brazil as well. And also we are thinking about doing the follow-ups from Gaia and maybe LSST and this kind of thing. Uh, I think it's very interesting. Sure. I would be very interested to discuss uh, more about uh, your projects. Thank you. Okay, Bruno, thank you. So, Felipe Braga Ribas has also a question. Please, Felipe. Hi, Paulo. Hi. Hi, Hello. Felipe. Nice to see you. Thank you for the very good talk. Uh, I may have missed the, no, from the beginning, but uh, I, 
uh, I, I would uh, like to, to hear more about uh, the determination of the Yarkovsky effect of apophis and the, the consequences on this. And of, for, of course, this can be translated for the older uh, near or so objects. And, and what are the, I mean, the, I think this is the best way to justify this kind of, of observations because they can hit her some one day. So I want to listen more about this, what, what you, you have done and, and yeah, yeah. Do, the do implications. You slide? Yeah, yep. sure. Do you see the slide here? Yes. Uh, so basically, just look at the small inset there where you have several determinations of Yarkovsky. So uh, the, 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 you have a, a longer history in the larger plot, but we just focus here, which is the, let's say, the last year, during the last close encounter of Apophis. Here is the, in A, you have the error bars that were available in January, so with all the best measurements from the ground and some uh, uh, radar available uh, from the last uh, uh, close encounter in uh, 2003, if I'm not wrong. No, sorry. Uh, yes. No, more recent one. Well, forget. Now I'm making confusion. Anyway, <laughs> this is uh, what was available in January. Then uh, uh, we added some uh, optical uh, astrometry from the ground. We obtained a fit uh, with the error bus in B. Uh, and then we, by adding a recent radar this year, uh, uh, early March, we obtained the error bus in C. And then by adding the occultation, we had the small error bus by the red dot. So you see basically in a few months, in three months, the collapse of the error bars, mainly due to radar, I would say, because without the radar, probably we, don't, we would not have the, had the, a successful occultation, a successful prediction. But still, by a factor two, simply due to the occultation. So now this, this specific value that is shown here is computed with the first occultation, which we now know is probably not the best one. Now we have three more. I made the computation again. Essentially, the error bar remain about the same. The absolute value should shift maybe by a few percent. But uh, this is the level of accuracy we can get, and you are right. Uh, if we can uh, demonstrate that uh, occultations have a big role for uh, the investigation of nearest asteroids, these are big drivers for the project and for get support to develop uh, observation networks. And in fact, uh, uh, we are waiting for an answer from ESA because we proposed the project, uh, especially for Didymos, uh, that is a target of uh, HERA mission, uh, to, to uh, deploy telescopes for, uh, for Didymos and other crosses. But uh, this is the new frontier, I think. Thank you. Uh, uh, maybe I can make a following question. Sure. Is exactly the how to justify other uh, the observe for example the your robotic telescope uh, because well it's okay it's nice we we understand the uh, the good part of observing many stellar occultations but what do you do with that I mean of course uh, well for, I, I, I think, for, I think for we us can... being, okay here, go on. <laughs> yeah sure I think we can really address the lack of information about uh, asteroids that for, for the moment we are not uh, reachable by occultation because now we can uh, uh, by multiplying the number of events it means that we observe smaller asteroids so we can uh, observe smaller family members uh, observe their make statistics on their shapes which are informative about their collisional evolution uh, i mentioned the example of the barbarian asteroids as one possible but uh, you can imagine several more you, you can hope to detect some satellites by occultation, the, so you get some physical parameters that are related to the mass and the orbit of these systems. Uh, and we can try by astrometry alone, uh, really to reach the sensitivity to measure Yarkovsky directly in the main belt. Of course, by Gaia itself, but Gaia uh, will be just five years plus uh, extended mission. So maybe eight or nine years in total of observation. This is not enough for Yarkovsky. You need a secular, uh, this is a secular term. So you want, uh, ideally, to go longer than 10 years. And uh, this is the way to go. This is the way to ensure that you can reach uh, Gaia accuracy after Gaia. For me.
Okay. Thank you. Thank you again. Congratulations. Thank you, Felipe. Thank you, Felipe. So, any any further question or comments? So, I think that's it, Paulo. Thanks very much for your presentation. It was really great. I think it was. Uh, you are great. welcome. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, so, take care of yourself, everybody. So, the epidemics will, will finish. Uh, so, one day, <laughs> yeah. and we will meet again. <laughs>